April 24, 2004. Didn't see it coming, didn't hear it coming. When it exploded beside me, that's when everything went white. Growing up, um, I was more of a loner type kid at first. I grew up in uh, one of the city gangs. We had our little run-ins and stuff with the uh, police. I used to steal cars and go joyriding. Around my 10th grade year, I really started getting into church and sports, and I got so involved in sports, I didn't, I didn't have time for the game. So it was like, either you're gonna do one or the other. I was having fun, and I was having fun, and I getting in trouble having fun. He was in everything from basketball, cross, cross country running and football. I mean, he'd done everything. And we was there, well, I was there. <laughs> in every game, every track meet, everything. <laughs> My mother was a hard worker at that time. She was holding down two jobs and working side jobs to make sure we was taken care of. Everywhere he went, I was going in just following him. Terry took care of him. I mean, when, when mama wasn't around, she was like the second mama. So, you know, she took care of us, just like my brother Michael took care of me because my father wasn't around. Michael was my, was my role model, really, to everything, you know. It was because of Michael I started playing sports. I actually was going to drop out of college and just go straight into the military. And so he kind of pushed me toward the ROTC program and finishing up my education and stuff. So my brother was more the uh, guiding light toward the Army. After he came back from Kuwait, he was doing a, a night shift job. In uh, 1995, uh, he got uh, hit by a drunk driver on the way home. You know, after all that fighting and you know, working on bombs and defusing bombs and getting out of all them cases, he get hit by a drunk driver who runs a light and kills him. So that, that was a big impact on me right there. And it was because of him I got into the military. So I always emulated whatever he tried to do. When the Iraq war started, um, it was just really horrific because that was something that really worried me, you know, because they were sending so many troops over there when I first went into Iraq, you know, it, it, it's a horrible smell. <laughs> it's like all the sewage is broke or something like that. It, the area is kind of like a junkyard to me. Looks like look like a big junkyard. Need to be cleaned up real bad. That morning, uh, I had just finished playing cards and stuff with my buddies, and uh, somebody came banging on the door saying that they think they're having an incoming fire gonna come in, so they want all us to go to the bunkers and stuff. That's when I got hit by the RPG. And after that, everything, I don't remember. We don't have no pulse and the machines are saying that you're dead. Then you go in the body bag. I mean, I was up here watching um, television. We was already nervous and upset because we didn't know what was going on. They had listed me as uh, killed in action. They were looking for my social security number and stuff for identification for me. And uh, nobody put my dog tags and my personal effects stuff at the time. So the nurse came by and uh, they didn't have the body bag all the way zipped up. So she just opened up the body bag to see what my dog tags were. And she started seeing uh, bubbles coming out from my tray and realized that, you know, this guy's still alive. So they pulled me back in and started working on me, got me resuscitated properly, and then they shipped me out to Baghdad. And that's when we got the phone call saying that, you know, that Anthony had, you know, had got hit. They said that he may possibly be dead. They really weren't sure. end up in a coma for 62 days. 
when Anthony finally woke up, I was just thanking God that he pulled through, that he woke up. Uh, initially, I, I couldn't remember anything. <laughs> I mean, my, uh, you know, you got a guy that that's, uh, was a whiz in math and computers and stuff, and then you get a brain injury where you learn how to do one plus one. You know, equals two all over again. I said, I almost said it wrong then. Uh, I got post-traumatic stress. Uh, lost vision in my right eye. I have T7 spinal cord injury. Uh, I lost my full hip. I don't have a hip at all. I have what they call a girdle in there. Leave my leg uh, one and a half inch sorted on the other side. My most obvious one, I lost my right arm. During my recovery, you know, you had to just learn so much all over again. You know, I started remembering stuff about my brother when I was going through my my recovery phase, I guess you want to call it, when I was in therapy. You know, like you kind of hear your brother in, in your head saying like, you know, you can do this, push harder, you know. I know you ain't gonna give up on me now, you little punk, you know. <laughs> you know, you hear those little voices in your head that kind of get you motivated and keep going. The fact that he believed in himself, you know, all Anthony needed was some support. When I got back, I got into the aerobics group and started doing all the aquatic exercises to strengthen my body. And that's when I ran into Nico. And he changed the whole aspect of everything I was doing. When I first saw Anthony, he was uh, 310 pounds in a wheelchair smoking cigarettes. And I knew that, hey, this is somebody that we really need to reach out to. It looks like he needs a little extra support and he needs somebody to get behind him. And so that's when I approached him and let him know about what we could do through the CAF Operation Rebound Program. At first, he was a bit tentative. Uh, Anthony's first response to the program when I told him about it, he's a bit, you know, wary. He had uh, been told these things before that organizations would support him, and they didn't come through with what he expected. And I think really talking to Tamika, his wife, uh, she convinced him to, hey, why don't you give these guys a, a call and see what they can do for you? I told him I wanted to get back into uh, cycling, and I want to get back into uh, my martial arts. He said, well, why don't you do it? I'm like, well, the finances ain't there. And I don't have a train. I, I, I kind of like made all the excuses. And then it was like a month later, my bike show up. Operation Rebound actually bought me a bike. It, it was like my bike. <laughs> and they bought me all the stuff that needed to go on that bike so that I could be able to perform with it. Sports are incredibly important for these, these men and women. And a lot of them find that they end up doing things they never thought they could do prior to being injured. I don't think Anthony was thinking about doing triathlon prior to losing his arm and a big chunk of his hip missing and losing eyesight in one eye. That would have never, never occurred to him. And now he's a triathlete. Challenge Athletes Foundation was key to Anthony's uh, progression through his martial arts training. Uh, we've been providing the funding for his training for the last two and a half years now. I tell Nico and them all the time, I say, I'm probably the first black belt amputee that made it all the way through a Yang Wanru testing to become a uh, black belt. You know, I had the dream to open up my own school and uh, passed out a bunch of applications. But, you know, I didn't think that many people were going to come back. Uh, the next month, uh, we went from seven students to 301. I think he realized what his purpose was. You know, I mean, we all here for a purpose. Some of us never get it, some of us do. And I believe Anthony has found his purpose. You have somebody who uh, obviously had some trouble as a youth and now he's making sure that kids don't get involved in those type of things. That's what Anthony's all about. And I think that's the spirit that he instills in these kids as well, where they see somebody who's different, you know, physically, and able to achieve, you know, a black belt or do a triathlon, and they go, if he can do it, maybe I can do it as well. Martial arts teaches us to never give up, and that's what that tattoo symbolizes. 
It says no matter how many times that I go through and I struggle, and no matter how many times I'm beat down, I'll never give up. I'll always be persistent. Well, that's the pretty ring. Oh, what the color represent? Any particular thing? Yeah, that's the purple heart. Oh, okay. It's beautiful. Oh, I'm so proud of you. Okay. <laughs> I am so proud of you. <laughs> Even with all the things that I went through, and then to be able to have a son and be able to raise your son. Get the bike. Come on, push it. Oh, I'm ecstatic. <laughs> I'm very happy, you know. You know, I have my good days and bad days, I think, like any other uh, disabled guy has. But overall, I'm, I'm very happy. And not just happy, but content. And, you know, that's what I'm most proud of, that I'm able to get up in the morning have somebody counting on me, have somebody looking forward to seeing me. You know, that, that, that gives me that lift and that pride that I need to keep going.